Are you passionate about foreign policy, national security, and the latest in domestic politics? Consider becoming a member of the DSR Network, your go-to source for in-depth analysis and insightful discussions. With the DSR Network podcasts, stay ahead of the curve on global affairs. Each episode features top experts, policymakers, and thought leaders who break down complex issues into digestible, engaging conversations. From breaking news to historical context, we cover the topics that matter most. Whether it's the intricacies of international diplomacy, the latest in national security strategies, or the dynamics of U.S. politics, the DSR Network has you covered. Members receive an ad-free listening experience, bonus content for virtually all of our shows, an invitation to join the DSR Slack community, enhanced show notes for select podcasts, and much more. Visit the dsrnetwork.com slash buy and enter code graduate to receive 30% off the regular membership price for the first year or first month. That's the dsrnetwork.com slash buy and code graduate. Thank you very much for your support. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. In recent days, MAGA lawmakers and personalities have been pushing a really silly talking point. The American people are in full-scale revolt against the criminal conviction of Donald Trump. As House Speaker Mike Johnson put it this week, people everywhere across our land have, quote, realize that we have reached a new low. Well, the polls are telling a very different story, finding majority support for Trump's conviction. And one of these surveys from the progressive firm Data for Progress finds that this is the case even among swing voters. So today we're talking to Data for Progress's executive director, Danielle Dyseroth, about what all these numbers are telling us and what conclusions we can draw for them. Welcome, Danielle. Thanks so much for having me, Greg. So before we get to the Data for Progress poll, I want to recap what some other polls have found. A YouGov CBS poll found that 57% of Americans said the jury reached the right verdict. An ABC News survey found that 50% of Americans said the same. And Morning Consult found that 54% of voters approve of the verdict. Now, we should be cautious about quick polls taken right after a verdict like this, but still, that's a pretty clear pattern, isn't it? Yes, it's definitely a very clear pattern coming from several different pollsters. When several different pollsters who ask the question in different ways and sometimes even with different samples, so um, some pollsters look at all registered voters, some polls look at just voters who they think are going to turn out in November. Um, So when I as a pollster look at all of these different sources pointing towards the same similar conclusion, um, that's a pretty clear trend. Okay, so the Data for Progress poll is even more instructive, I think. It also finds that a majority of likely voters, 56%, approve of Trump's guilty verdict. But you guys also parse out who the swing voters are, and you found that 60% of swing voters approve. Can you talk a little bit about how you identify those swing voters? Sure. We're really excited about this new methodology that we've developed to identify swing voters in our likely voter sample. So we're looking at uh, how our poll respondents answer a number of different questions, including how they say they voted in 2020, who they say they're going to vote for in 2024, and how they feel about both Biden and Trump And to add one more layer to the equation, if they're considering more than one option, such as a third party candidate in this election. So we're really trying to take a comprehensive view because um, this electorate looks pretty different than the past uh, presidential electorate, um, given that there are two uh, deeply unpopular and deeply familiar incumbents. Um, There's a a third party candidate that's pulling um, at historically high levels for a third party candidate at this point in the cycle. So to really capture the quote unquote swing voters, we wanted to dig deeper into those folks who are truly (laughs) on the fence. And it's amazing that you found that six in 10 of those voters approve of the verdict. I I thought this finding from your 
poll was also interesting. A majority of overall voters, 53 percent, also say Trump's trial was fair versus only 39 percent who say it was rigged. Among independents, you found 53 percent said his trial was fair and 52 percent of those swing voters that you just talked about said the same. I should note that the CBS poll also found that 56 percent of overall respondents say Trump got a fair trial. So that kind of supports what you guys found. So can you talk a little bit about that finding that a fairly solid majority say that Trump's trial was fair and not rigged? Absolutely. Um, As expected, there is some polarization when we look across party lines. Um, 88 percent of Democrats say the trial was fair versus um, 76 percent of Republicans who say that the trial was rigged. But notably, 18 percent of Republicans said that the trial was fair, um, as well as that uh, 53 percent of independents, as you said. So I think this is interesting because while there's sort of an overall decline in trust in institutions that we've seen over the years, especially uh, thinking about the Supreme Court, um, I found that this was interesting because um, this trial, I think, really broke through in the news in a way that it's been really hard for either Biden or Trump to find events that truly sort of capture the zeitgeist in a way that this trial has. And it's very telling that a jury of 12 New Yorkers, a jury of average American citizens, uh, came to this very, very clear decision. And I think that um, that really came through to the American people. Yeah, I think there's no question that for for a lot of people, juries are are powerful and compelling things, right? And and that brings me to what a lot of these MAGA personalities are pushing now, this kind of scam that the American people are revolting against the conviction. I'm just going to cite a few examples. Mike Johnson said that stuff I mentioned earlier. Janine Pirro said Trump's big fundraising pull after the verdict shows that, quote, most Americans know in their gut that the verdict wasn't fair. Jesse Waters said that, quote unquote, American people see this as an effort by nitwits, meaning Democrats, to destroy a man because he threatens their power. I think it's important to note that these MAGA propagandists aren't just saying that majorities support Trump, which they don't. They're also saying that majorities reject the process as illegitimate. That's a very different kind of attack, isn't it? And especially it's interesting given what you just said, which this the, 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 this spectacle really kind of broke through to the American people as as something that was legit and compelling. Yeah, I think that this trial really sharpened into focus what maybe some voters, especially some of these swing voters, which we've identified are younger and more diverse than sort of the likely voting population writ large. I think this trial elevated the fact that Trump is now a convicted felon and Trump's sort of, uh, you know, myriad misdeeds that have been um, almost become so commonplace over the years that many voters have either become sort of numb to them, stopped paying attention or forgotten about them, um, was once again in the spotlight in a way that um, really they haven't ever been before, you know, despite all of the headlines about Trump's uh, various um, activities and the trials, not only in New York, but also um, in Florida and Georgia. This New York trial was the only one that has actually happened so far and produced a verdict. And that's powerful for um, voters to to see and to remember as they're heading into the summer and really starting to perk up into the the dynamics of this election. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, you'd be the first to, to agree to this, I think. But we don't know whether this really ends up uh, hurting Trump all that much in the long run. But this is still compelling stuff. And and, and it's it's really interesting how heavily invested MAGA is in pushing this kind of contrary idea that Trump is backed up not just by a majority, but like a formidable, overwhelming one. It's kind of like what I've called the myth of Trump's in, in, invincibility. It's kind of essential to his aura. But the irony is Trump has never once had majority support in this country. And in this case, if anything, the system bent over backward to be accommodating to him, right? He's had the best legal representation money can buy, funded by Trump donors, is far better than anything most criminal defendants can dream of. So it's just it's just sort of an amazing scam that that his supporters are trying to push that 
the American people overwhelmingly think he was railroaded and treated unfairly. Exactly. I think the, you know, it's June and there are a lot of factors that will be weighing heavily on voters' minds when they go into the voting booth this November. Obviously, the economy, inflation, the price of goods and services is weighing heavily, especially on swing voters' minds. So I think the question for the Biden campaign becomes, how do we keep this relevant along with all of the other uh, sort of MAGA uh, policy proposals that have uh, continued to be, be extraordinarily relevant, such as reproductive rights, um, as we head into the summer and fall and, um, you know, be able to reach those voters, especially those swing voters who um, very, very many of them are you know, what we would maybe traditionally think of as supporters of the Democratic Party or supporters of President Biden, like younger voters and voters of color. Um, and, and this this Trump trial, I think, is one more way to sort of continue skimming those voters off the top and bringing them back, uh, back home in a, in a sense. Let's talk about a darker aspect to all this. We should acknowledge that the outpouring of donor money to Trump after his conviction does suggest that his base at least appears energized by it. We just had Dem pollster Celinda Lake on here, and she said that for now, Trump voters appear more mobilized by it than Democratic voters do. I wonder if you're seeing something like that or whether you agree with it. And I want to ask about, in particular, this number that you guys also found, which was troubling. Only 37 percent of swing voters said they'd heard a lot about Trump being convicted versus 61 percent of likely voters overall. So there's still a lot of work for Democrats to do here, right? Um, both in terms of getting those swing voters educated about what happened, but also mobilizing Democratic voters. Are you seeing anything that sort of suggests to you that, that Democratic voters are, are are not quite as energized by this as Trump voters are? You know, that's a really good question. And I think it's a little early to tell. Um, what I will say is that those swing voters are, that w- what we found when we were doing our, our deep dive into them a few weeks ago was that um, these swing voters are not getting their news from traditional sources. If they're getting any news at all, it's coming from YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, social media, um, hearing from their peers. Um, and, and we know that, uh, you know, President Trump just joined TikTok the other day and has already amassed more followers and more likes than the entire cumulative um, Biden campaign TikTok has in its you know months of existence. So there is clearly a very fervent um, MAGA base out there, as you said, that is energized and pouring in money um, and as a result of this. But I I do want to caution that, you know, when we're doing surveys, we see this thing called non-response bias, where um, this, for uh, to just put it plainly, in 2020, um, many polls um, underestimated the percentage that President Trump would uh, get because there are quote unquote quieter Republican voters out there. And we saw sort of the reverse trend happen in 2022 where Democrats performed better than many polls may have expected. So there's always sort of this pollster caution that we may be seeing some of those quieter Biden voters, <laughs> maybe not necessarily pouring out their their support in, in polls. The Republican base is clearly agitated right now and making themselves known. But Again, I think it's a bit early to tell. And, um, you know, the Democratic Party has had no shortage of, um, you know, opportunities over the past nine months, especially to be divided and to be sort of lackluster and how they feel about um, President Biden. So, um, you know, it, it really may, remains to be seen whether that this this conviction can help uh, juice up the base more than just the resistance wine moms <laughs> who the Biden campaign does really need to win. Absolutely. And I want to ask you about this uh, this pool of voters that we constantly talk about in the discourse, the young and non-white, low-propensity voters. Nate Cohn writes about them pretty regularly. Everybody writes about them pretty regularly. Um, is, there, is there an opening here to use this conviction of Trump and to use the fact that the system performed well under immense strain, under the strain of intense mega attacks and so forth, right? Is there a way to use that to to win some of these voters? And especially with the Robert F. Kennedy Jr. factor here, I would think that there's a real risk that 
those voters, if they get turned against Trump, still don't end up going to Biden. They go to RFK because they think that's some way of registering a protest against the system. It somehow maybe he's kind of like a cultural figure that appeals to them in some sense. I don't know why, but there it is. Is there a way to use this conviction to get those voters back to Biden in some way and not go to RFK? Oh, yeah, I I think that there is always potential for this, uh, you know, this this conviction to play that role. Um, when we did our deep dive into swing voters a few weeks ago, this was pre-verdict. I will I will caveat that. Um, we did find that swing voters were more concerned. We asked them directly, what are you more concerned about? Trump's threats to democracy or Biden's age and competence? And the Trump's threats to democracy edged out Biden's age and competence in, in a direct head-to-head -head concern. What are what really bothers you more? Even though those swing voters at the same time said their biggest misgiving about Biden and their biggest doubts were his age and his competence. So um, I think that that is one glimmer of hope that this conviction could be um, used to help target some of those voters. Um, but again, I think with the economy still such a major issue to these voters, these voters who aren't clued into the news as much, who may hear something in passing now and then not realize it much later on, but um, are much more concerned about the price of gas, the price of rent, the price of food. Um, I still think those economic policy priorities are uh, a bigger opportunity for the Biden campaign to uh, tap into those voters. And they sure seem to agree with you on that. And this brings up that low propensity, young and non-white voter pool we're talking about. They're putting immense resources right now into to targeting those voters with an economic message. And they seem reluctant as to talk much about Trump's conviction. I just, I've got to think that at least on some level, having a convicted felon as the Republican nominee allows for the message, and it's a true message, that if you vote for RFK, maybe you're making it more likely that a convicted felon is president, and, and that's pretty dangerous. Is there some way to do that? I think there is. I think it's harder to, to get that message across, especially to younger folks who have great disdain for both major party candidates, just a general distrust in Congress and D.C. writ large. And they see um, Kennedy as perhaps a disruptor in the way that many voters saw um, Trump in 2016. But I do think for some of those, uh, you know, those swing voters who are maybe a bit older, a bit more, uh, you know, traditional, those who might be considering sitting out, I think that this conviction is definitely a way to hook them back in. Um I, I think all the time about like the the Biden coalition of 2020 was so diverse that there's really no one size fits all um, message that to, to in this in where we are today in 2024 to get them all driving out again uh, to, to vote for Biden this year. So um, thinking about those voters who are perhaps never Trumpers the what we would think is like you know the hashtag resistance you know there's this is a way to re-engage them remobilize them and i i do think that will make a difference that's really interesting i mean we we've we heard the phrase the anti-maga majority a whole bunch it's clear that there is an anti-maga majority out there it showed up in 2020 and it showed up in 2022 to to, to take down some of the big maga statewide candidates but it's fraying and and a lot of those constituent groups are wandering. And if I understand you correctly, you're kind of saying that something like this uh, conviction is just what you'd need to kind of reinvigorate and reunite that coalition. I think so. I think for the for the median Democratic voter, this is, you know, something that's definitely energizing, um, especially after it feels like, um, you know, the Democratic Party has faced deep, deep schisms um, since October in the week of the Israel and Palestine conflict. This conviction, in a way, is one way to really bring the band back together and remind the Demo Par Democratic Party who uh, they are fighting against. And again, 
reminding them and raising the stakes um, of uh, this is the same person who did January 6th, now a convicted felon. Um, I feel almost insane trying to like talk myself into why this matters, but it does matter. Voters are good and decent people. And the fact that one of the major party candidates is a convicted felon is, of course, going to matter in the election. Well, you'd think so. You'd sure hope so. Um, well, you've made a really good case for that happening. So, Danielle Diceroth, thanks so much for talking to us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Everybody, we've got some good stuff for you up at TNR.com right now. Timothy Noah on the irresistible temptation in Congress to trade on inside information and pad expense accounts. And Matt Ford on Texas Republicans' brazen plan to control their state forever. We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network. 